First Sergeant Cap here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. And today in the workshop, we have another viewer requested video. Now, I've sort of delayed making this video because I haven't quite figured out how to make these to my own personal satisfaction. I'm pretty close, but there are a few things that we'll go over that um, we could probably use your support on. So today we are making the mysterious issue tent poles for uh, the shelter tent. Two-piece construction, tin, uh, soldered tin sleeve, roughly about four feet uh, with a round tenon on the end. Now, this is tricky. I bought uh, this set and uh, it was worth every penny. Uh, the shipping on these sorts of things can be pretty high. So uh, don't be shocked if you decide that you want to go the route of purchasing your own, if it's appropriate for your um, impression. But uh, these have long been mysterious because they're, as far as research knows, there is no known extant examples of these tent poles. And um, as far as documentation, there is very, very little, uh, maybe only a few letters from soldiers um, actually talking about having these at all. Um, oddly enough, and is kind of typical, one of those few sources of documentation actually comes from a Berdan sharpshooter. Um, Company L, uh, second USSS, it looks like. Um, so once again, primary source documentation for all tents. Pick it up if you have, if you want to make your tents, learn how to set them up. You just want to know the backstory contractors what materials for what you know time periods you want to do. So on page 75, um, it, uh, in his letter uh, during the Peninsula Campaign on May 16th, 1862, Josiah Cheney uh, wrote from Lee's White House Plantation on the Pamunkey River, uh, 25 miles from Richmond, providing his first description of their new tents to his dearest Melissa, our tents are made of two pieces of linen canvas and about six feet square with buttons and buttonholes on three sides to button at the top. Also to lengthen out as long as we choose, but we only double so as to make in two lengths of men head to head. Each tent will hold three and on a pinch four men. There can sleep comfortably in one. Each man has to carry on his back a part of the tent. Where three occupy one, two of them will take each one half of the tent, plus the third one takes the stakes and poles. The poles, here we go, are about four feet long, are in two pieces, supported when put to use by a tin ferrule about five inches long, which covers the joint. They are about the size of a hoe handle. Uh, a third piece of canvas can be buttoned onto the end cornerwise, and it goes on uh, about uh, tent use. So there is some description. Uh, we also don't have anything in quartermaster reports that can guide us into any sorts of numbers that were ordered um, or who got them. So there is some speculation as to whether or not the army actually ever issued these or if this was something that was provided by states or it was they were purchased on the private market. Then you also have the, uh, the, the, the sort of the practical part of did soldiers carry these at all because it's just a bunch of weight and you can usually find something when you stop for the night on a bivouac um, or make something more substantial like um, Matthews Wood and Company D. Every time they were going to be somewhere for a while, he started to make a mini cabin to make his tent as comfortable for him and his comrade as possible. Um, so with all of that, that's one of the few sources of documentation that says these existed and soldiers had them and sharpshooters had them. Um, but the only time that, the first time these actually show up in military records is 1879. Um, so also a little further up on the same page, the poles for wartime shelter tents needed to be about four feet in length to achieve a usable pitch to the tent. Manufactured poles were likely similar to the ones described in 1879 as round, one inch diameter, and three feet, 10 inches long to be made of poplar, pine, or other suitable wood each upright to be in two parts of about equal length, beveled and joined in a tin socket four inches long, firmly soldered and secured to lower part with two tacks. A uh, shoulder three quarters of an inch deep, 
to be turned on upper end of uprights, making a spindle or stud one half of an inch in diameter. Um, a spindle or stud, as described, would just about fit the grommet holes on shelter halves observed in the database, referring to the research done in the book. Uh, alternatively, the spindle may have been whittled down to get it into the quarter to three-eighths inch grommet holes. So in this case, um, there, there's numerous uh, overlaps um, in tent construction, uh, tent contracts during the war, as well as uh, we, we know uh, from like Wyman White, uh, for example, his, his first tents were battlefield pickup. So, um, and you know, you know, so some units got their tents before others, um, some kept them, some didn't, um, they were mixed matched. Um, and then you have just the contractors, there's some documentation in the book where um, there was, they were phasing out the old model, uh, but still using what they had in stock and then just sort of modifying to uh, newer quartermaster specs uh, later on. So this uh, ability, this note that the soldiers could uh, whittle uh, the tenon or the spindle here uh, to fit their personal needs is an important note to, to keep in mind. So if you buy one of these, or you make your own and it doesn't fit your, your grommet, uh, know that um, they're designed to be customized to the tent's uh, unique needs. So um, these ones, honestly, I can't remember where I bought these. Uh, just do some persistent uh, internet search, you'll find them. Uh, these ones are made out of poplar. Uh, pine is super cheap, um, but so is poplar. Poplar is gonna be one of your uh, most affordable hardwoods that you can get. Um, and it's maybe just a couple dollars more if you can get the, the one inch. So to, to make just one of these, you need two, one for each end, but if you were to carry them, you would have one, uh, or like uh, Josiah Cheney said, um, one, you know, the third buddy would just carry all the, the gear for the tent. I'd be curious to see how long they kept that up. Um, so you'll need two one inch dowels. If you're making these for the first time, buy a couple extras or like buy one, one extra, so like buy three, and then you can cut into smaller sections and then test out all of your equipment. Make sure your saws and angles uh, are, and tools are set up right. So that way you don't like go through all the work. It's like, oh man, one side's four inches shorter. Um, so like I said, these ones I found online, uh, I wanna say they were maybe like $45, somewhere in there. Um, very well made um, with the, with the tin sleeves, held in with tacks, and then soldered. Now this sleeve is sort of like the big mystery. Uh, we'll talk about the angle, and um, we'll talk about the tin in here shortly. So <clears throat> the tin sleeve, um, well anything tin in the hobby is for some reason unnecessarily impossible to find out anything about. Um, it just, it seems like, you know, it's, it's so hard to find actual tin. I don't, there's like very little resources online about people actually demonstrating um, how, you know, how to make stuff out of tin and, and the soldering and the process. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like where do you even find this stuff to do it right is sort of a, a big mystery. So if you were a tinsmith out there, you were friends with one, you did it in the past, um, encourage you Take your phone and educate the living history community about some of the, these basic, um, simple projects that all of us can learn from and learn a skill that would have been so much more common 150 years ago um, than what it is now. Because the elements of tinsmithing are, are fairly straightforward. But there are a lot of details that we need, like where to get the tin and what tools to use and work holding ideas that make all the difference in the world. So um, last year I was approached to make a company set of uh, these issue poles. I was like, I, I don't, I don't, I've never, I've never seen one, um, and I don't know how they're made, and I'm not so sure about this tin work. I don't honestly I don't think I can't, I don't think I can source the tin. So I kind of hem and hawed, uh, but they were persistent. It's like, okay. I'll do a batch of uh, 15 sets as prototypes. As long as you know, like, I can't guarantee what they're gonna look like, but if you're willing to commit, I'll make them, I'll, it'll be a learning process, um, and I'll give you one heck of a deal, because I don't, I don't, I don't make, I don't try to make much money on prototypes. A lot of times I just 
give it away or, you know, parts plus consumables. So um, here's the one that I got that's just, I mean, look at that. Nice solder line. I mean, I have not been able to replicate that. And um, I've tried just about every solder you can commercially buy, um, every type of heat source. Uh, I have like a bag full of different types of fluxes, um, different diameters of wire, you name it. I, I've tried it. So there's some sort of mystical combination there that I'm not getting. Um, so before the keyboard warriors out there push up the glasses, break the knuckles and get to uh, laying waste on the keyboard, before you leave all these comments about how you should do it, again, I challenge you for the good of all the community, grab your phone, grab a camera, film the how-to, show us how to do it. Um, and if you, know, if you really know you know, really know your stuff and you wanna share with the community, let us know on our Facebook page, share us a link, because um, you will be doing a huge favor to many, many, many people out there that are hungry for this rare information. So again, nice tin sleeve, nice solder job, very well made. Um, and this is the closest thing I could get. So this is just some, I don't know, it's like coated sheet metal I got at Hobby Lobby. It kind of looks the part. And then once it, um, it's outside for a while, it dulls quite a bit. But, you know, it's definitely not the same thing. Um, and this, after tons and tons of practice, this is the best I can get. And um, it's not, you know, it's pretty clean. Um, it's not like the, the super, you know, deepest set on the solder in the seam, but I've never had one break because the way uh, that I, uh, I make these, there's a lot of overlap, so you have a lot of structural integrity from the, the metal itself. So this is what I'll be showing you. Um, not to tell you this is how you do it because it's, I mean, compare, I mean, look at these two. I'm not, I'm not doing it right, but this works. So maybe if you're out there and you try it the way that I do, um, that could give you a starting point um, for what not to do or a place to pick up and improve and explore something else. So this is the room for improvement um, working prototype right now. And this is ideally where we all get to. So we have that and we got, uh, so we'll need some metal. We'll get to this later. And so now let's talk about the spindle real quick. So um, I want to, so I imagine they mentioned turning, but there's lots of what, like, there's a couple of different things that that can mean. So odds are, like um, uh, at the Maine Maritime Museum um, in the carpenter shop, they have these giant uh, lathes, um, just huge long beds uh, uh, on them. And so I imagine if you're doing a uh, manufacturer of these, you're just going to have a really long bed uh, lathe where you can, you can turn these really quick. Um, you, you even have a, like a duplicator. Uh, so you can just like crank these out in the thousands uh, for the military. Now, if you don't have any of those tools uh, like these ones, um, you can do is you can just uh, center drill uh, and tap in a dowel. That's not what they did. And so I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it. What is sort of the common man uh, way that you could do it affordably and maybe with some traditional hand tools. So let's see. So I just so happen to have some Wheelwright's tools. Now, uh, Angle's Coat Shop, uh, if you don't follow that channel, it's, it's amazing. It's just, it's a, it's a master Wheelwright uh, or wagon right. Um, in Wyoming, I think. And he has an amazing channel, he's a great personality, and he recently did a long episode all about these tools I'm gonna to talk to you about. So to uh, turn it, I use uh, two tools. So this is a spoke pointer. Um, it's, it's just a giant pencil sharpener. Uh, you can usually find these at most antique stores, or usually, these ones can be yeah, 15 to $30. You could probably find them cheaper where, you know, where, you, where you're at. And um, they have a, an iron, 
and uh, a gauge, and this one's got measurements on it, and it has the uh, pyramidal uh, tapered chuck on it for um, uh, a, a brakes. And then it just has this round section so you can make a point on whatever you're, you want to put a, a tenon on. And then you have uh, this tool. There's lots of makes out there. Uh, and it goes by several different names, but I call it a hollow auger. And so what this is, is you have an adjustment. Let's see, right there. So you have your adjustments right here. And you can set the diameter of your uh, tenon that you're going to make. Now this one doesn't have it. Um, but if you do decide to go this way and experiment, if you have a choice, try to look to find the ones that have the depth stop. Um, if you plan on using this repeatedly, that depth stop is going to come in handy. Um, Angles is, you know, a master and he doesn't like the depth stops. But when I was batching these out like crazy, I kind of made my own out of a piece of bent steel and a clamp. Uh, saved me a lot of time. And then again, it has an iron, cuts around the edge, and you spin it in your brace, and you go down to your desired depth. So they come in different sizes, different styles. Sometimes they'll have pre-made holes. Once you kind of know what these are, you'll start to see them everywhere. Um, and these, these are typically around the $40 to $50 ones. The biggest thing when you, when you shop, turn it over and look at the iron. Because uh, sometimes what you'll see is this corner will just be totally chipped out. And if it's just a little bit, you can probably sharpen it down, depending on how much uh, tool steel you have here. Uh, but just try to make sure that this iron edge is in uh, good condition before you bite. Everything else you can clean up. So, enough of me yapping. Let's go ahead and get to cutting some wood. Now we are just about ready to get cutting our dowel. I have my miter gauge uh, set to 68 degrees. Nowhere that I've seen has it specified, but the other one that I have is at 68 degrees, um, and it seems to work really well. The whole idea is that you're going for um, a pretty severe angle that will um, give you maximum surface area uh, inside the sleeve. Um, if you don't have this fancy setup, no big deal. You could just lay it out with a bevel gauge and cut it with a handsaw or just eyeball it with a handsaw as long as you have a nice straight clean cut. Speaking of cuts, um, before you start uh, cutting your dowel, go ahead and make sure you clean up the ends. A lot of times these uh, box store dowels will have paint on the end uh, or the cuts will be fairly rough. So before you get going, just kiss off the edges so you have a nice clean uh, smooth cut to start working with. Um, and then for where to cut it, you just want to cut it in the middle of the dowel. Um, uh, so that um, you have roughly even sides. Because of the curve of the blade, one side is going to be shorter a little bit than the other one, but it's not the end of the world as long as your set is identical. So with that, let's go ahead and get cutting. Now on the uh, longer of the halves, we need to start getting set up to put a point on this end. Because we want to cut uh, a half inch tenon onto the end of this. But a half inch hole, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna start on the hollow auger. So we have to put a point on here with the spoke pointer that's going to be a half of an inch on the top. Now, if you're getting started out and you don't have your tools set up yet, go ahead, find center on your tent pole, and you can lay yourself out a simple little guide. See how close you're getting. Now, you don't have to do this step. You can just keep pointing until the thing fits. Um, but you just want to make sure it, you know, it's, it's not too small. If it's too big, it just the uh, auger won't fit. So, ah, almost forgot. So this one actually has, I think, a one inch. Yeah, this one has a one inch tenon. 
the what was it, 1872 manual, 79 manual, something like that, had um, three quarters of an inch. Um, so if you want to do it by those standards, um, do three quarters of an inch. I like having a slightly longer uh, tendon. Uh, it gives you uh, more ability to you know put your tent on and run different size uh, ropes that you might have. A little, a little more gripping area, personal preference. So uh, I got in my brace, make sure it's tight, and then <clears throat> you just get sharpening. So you can see on my test piece right here, this is what this tool is going to make. We have our spoke pointed. Now to put on the hollow auger. And let's see, let's see how well I got this thing set. I may have to adjust it. Get it on there. And then it's all about trying to stay as perpendicular as you possibly can. And then just start slow. I'll give you a sneak peek. You can see we're already starting to get our tannin to form. Clean out the chips. And just go the rest of the way until you hit your desired depth. There we go, a half inch tenon without a lathe. And we can just clean this up with a little bit of sandpaper. Now, it's time to figure out the tin work. Now we are to the tin smithing portion of this video. <clears throat> I'm a woodworker, I'm not a tin smith, and so everything you're about to see here um, is just what I've been able to figure out and is by no means um, a way of me saying this is how you do it. But this is what I figured out, and right or wrong, I wanna show you my reasoning and how I do it. So you can either like learn from my idiocy, um, or uh, find an area that you could share a lot of helpful information to people trying to figure this out too. I think some of my issues could be my choice of metal. Um, uh, I, I chose this uh, stuff mostly because it looked the closest part and it was the right thickness and what I could find uh, easily in my area and also in quantity. That's the other thing too. Like when I took this on, I had to make a ton of these. Um, so this is what I picked up. Um, you can get this at Hobby Lobby. It's 10 bucks. And then here's the information on the back. 28 gauge, tin coated, 12 by 18. And you should, uh, I think I was, I think I'm able to get about like, uh, half a dozen uh, pairs of sleeves out of one sheet. So um, when you you know when you lay out, just try to make sure do yourself a favor and try to use as many of like the factory edges as you can. Um, you, as you work your way down, you're gonna have more and more cut edges. Uh, but just be mindful of the way you lay out your work, and you'll be happier with the results. Um, I think you'll need a couple of tools. Um, Way back in the day, I did um, residential HVAC, so I still have um, all my old sheet metal tools. So for laying out, I use a scribe, and uh, I just lay out four inches, cut it, and then make four inch squares. And then to cut the sheet metal, um, I use uh, these offset tin snips. These are always my favorite. A lot of people use the straights or the bulldogs, the aviators, um, and they work. Um, they just don't, I don't think they work as good as the offsets. Um, also too, I imagine if you use like the, the giant, you know, the giant scissor looking um, uh, tin snips, uh, you might get like a cleaner edge. These ones will leave, leave you a slight little corrugation on the cut. But you can clean that up with, um, you know, sandpaper or uh, uh, tap it out with a hammer. <clears throat> so now I have my square and then we come to work holding. 
So I have to figure out how to hold a flat piece of metal into the shape of a cylinder while I solder it. And that took some head scratching. So what I have set up here is what I came up with. May not be the best way, but it works for me. So I thought I'd share it with you. Um, I have a dowel in my vise um, that is the exact same size as my tent poles. Because you want to make sure that your sleeve is going to fit. You don't want it too loose and you definitely don't want it super tight. Um, so you want to make sure you have the same dowel. And of course, if you're soldering on wood, what is wood? It's flammable. So keep that in mind. Don't go crazy and you know, don't set this thing on fire because you're you know, putting map gas on this stuff for like 10 minutes, you know? Um, just, just be mindful. Um, <clears throat> I haven't had any problems. As you can see, it's, you know, it's just a little dirty. It's not on fire. Um, so then uh, you'll need a hammer. And the type of hammer you use isn't so important. You just want to make sure that your face is cleaned up. I just have this cheap Harbor Freight body hammer. I, I touched up on the belt sander, um, you know. You don't have to go crazy and like polish your, your hammer heads. But the, the whole idea is having like a nice, super clean and smooth hammer head is that anything, any dense divots, um, junk on your hammer head is going to get hit into your hammer when you hit it. Um, so if you want a clean surface, you have to have a, a clean, smooth hammer. So um, if you got to touch it up, touch it up, take the time. It'll give you a better result in the long run. Um, then I have couple of hose clamps uh, to hold my work um, onto my form and a driver for the hose clamps. My best results have come from a soldering gun with a, you know, a wide flat tip right there. Focus. Anyway, it's there. And then um, the solder that I've liked the best, not saying it's the right one, but this, I've been using this metal work solder and I've been pretty happy with it so far. It's given me the best results with the methods that I'm using. So all that being said, this is what I do. <clears throat> so being 28 gauge, this bends fairly easily. So you, you can do a lot of it with just your hands uh, and the form. And I just wanna pay attention to my good edges. So I have a good edge here, good edge here. And yeah, how do I wanna do that? Yeah. So <clears throat> what I like to do is uh, hold an edge evenly over the form and then just kind of add a little extra, a little bit of extra bend to the lip because when it comes together, I don't want the edges to sit up. I kind of want them to be a little flexed in because uh, it'll because it's just it's tricky to clamp and I don't want to have to have you know octopus hands and you know hold it down with like different screwdrivers and so I can hit that one part of the seam. So a little bit of pre-planning helps a little bit. So I have my little first lip and then the rest of it I'm going to kind of get started on a band and just kind of pay attention once I get a little bit started, I'll hit it some more, make sure it stays, keeps it shaped. <clears throat> so now I got something like that. Now I'm gonna repeat it on the other side while it's still open and easy to work with. Now I'm sure there's people out there who's going to be way more creative than me and like, oh, you should have done this with a jig. It's like, I'd be interested to hear that. <laughs> the nice thing about, about our channel is like we have such an amazing audience of knowledgeable, thoughtful, and polite people that just really enjoy sharing, sharing what they know or tips and tricks along the way. So now I have this shape. Where's my, my good edge? So I want to go like that. I need to bend it all the way around. Do it little chunks, kind of massage the metal. If you do too much at once, 
you'll you'll bend it. Um, well, you'll you'll crease it. We're obviously bending it, but you don't want to crease it. And just kind of work it. There we go. And then we come around. We're actually we're looking pretty good. Hey, I'm not making such a big fool of myself on camera today. First time for everything. Oh, actually, I'm gonna do this. Save myself some hassle. Now I put on hose clamp. And then I'll pull my um, hose clamp like a half or three uh, three quarters of an inch in from the ends, because then I'll, I can tack the ends. And if my uh, center is puckered, then I can release the, the clamp and uh, move it and adjust the clamp. And then just kind of adjust these equally and evenly. And then flush on that side, all right on that side. It's probably just a little touch of a file. It will be nice and flush. Now, the other thing, once you have this thing in place, is you want to be able to spin it. You don't want to roll your clamps around because you'll scratch your, your metal. Um, but that one's pretty good. This back clamp's a little loose. Because if you can't if you can't spin it, it's too tight. So you want it, you don't want it to spin super freely, but you want to be able to move it. You don't want this clamp to the form um, within an inch of its life. <clears throat> Okay, check my fit again. Okay, it spins. So now, um, I'm not gonna use this, but it is, wow, it's so cold in here. This isn't even gonna, oh, it started. It's really cold in the shop today. Um, so I'm just gonna add a little bit of heat to kind of warm up the piece. And of course, you know, this is hot, you know, use, Required protection, don't burn yourself. I'm not trying to like make it hot, I'm just trying to make it not 20 degrees. <laughs> It'll save me some soldering time. So I've tried using this to solder with, but I just get, you know, bad scorching. Um, I've tried flux, but I haven't liked my results from flux because, you know, it's probably because I don't know what I'm doing and, you know, <laughs> it's just not going my way. So I've just um, had, I've been happy with just using straight solder and a soldering gun. So I'm sure that'll, that'll change as I learn new things. <clears throat> okay. Let's warm up a little bit. And then we're just going to solder the seam. And so what I've learned is, in my experience, I have better, I have better luck working into the solder going down the seam and then um, putting the edge of the tip along the edge of the lip and that works pretty good. Now we're ready to install the sleeve that we just finished making. And we put it on the section without the tenon. And I don't know if it really matters, but I aligned the seam to the, the long edge of the pole. And then from here to here, I come down three inches. Just like that, nice fit, no wobble. And then we need to drive some tacks in. And the tacks are gonna go in three quarters of an inch up from the bottom. 
And one of these automatic center punches are fantastic for giving you a start for your drill bit. Let me drill your pilot hole so the bit doesn't wander all over and scratch the metal. Now, the ones that I bought use like three quarter inch uh, brass uh, wire nails. I don't think this is what they would have used, uh, but they work really well. And uh, the other thing is for tax, um, maybe they used something like this. This tack is out of an original Civil War folding chair. Uh, get any closer. So um, this could be something that they would have used. So if you keep your eyes open for these, you could probably find these uh, online as well. Uh, the only other thing that I have, but I don't think it would work very well, are these uh, headless cut brads. Uh, but um, if you just need a few of these, these little cut nails are the most expensive nails you can get. Um, so if you just need a few, then it's not worth buying. Uh, these tacks might be more close to what they use, but again, no known examples exist, so we don't know. But these wire, uh, brass wire ones work really nicely. So I got my hole set, and then I'm going to drill just through the metal. I don't need to drill into the wood. And then, <clears throat> remember when you use tiny drill bits, you don't push too hard. And then, run your nail home. And then do one on the opposite side of the seam. And the only thing you really need to pay attention to on placement is just making sure that your nails don't intersect inside the wood. There we go. Now, if we did this right, these two should meet up. Oh, that is a nice fit. Look at that. Not a single bit of wobble. That is, that's gorgeous. So, that is how I make an issue Civil War tent pole uh, based off the earliest known regulations um, post war. So like I said, if you want more information, where did I put it? Be sure to check out this book for more documentation about the, the history and mystery of the issue tent poles. Man, that is, I'm really happy with this one. Um, <clears throat> and then, again, yeah, if you have any tips um, on better ways to solder, where to get the solder, um, do us all a favor, share some uh, some sources. Uh, if, if you know how to do this right, please um, do a video and share it with the world. You'd be doing a lot of people a big favor. Um, to finish this, all I gotta do is you know take out this little price tag. I'll probably uh, chamfer the edges real quick. Um, this dowel's pretty clean. I probably won't sand it. Uh, and then maybe put some uh, boiled linseed oil on it for a little bit of added protection. Anyway, um, I hope this uh, video has been informative. It's been long, but there's a lot of odds and ends to have gotten into uh, over such a relatively simple project. Um, I hope this is helpful to you. Um, thank you as always for your uh, wonderful and thoughtful comments and being such a, being such a wonderful, supportive reenacting and living history community. Um, thanks for uh, subscribing. If you wanna stay up to date on all of our future videos, be sure to click that notification bell and We'll see you next time.